By the laws of the district, the locators or claimants of a ledge were obliged to do a fair and reasonable amount of work on their new property within 10 days after the date of the location or the property was forfeited and anybody could go and seize it that chose. So we determined to go to work the next day. About the middle of the afternoon, and as I was coming out of the post office, I met a Mr. Gardiner who told me that Captain John Nye was lying dangerously ill at his place, the Nine Mile Ranch, and that he and his wife were not able to give him nearly as much care and attention as his case demanded. I said if he would wait for me a moment, I would go down and help in the sick room. I ran to the cabin to tell Higby he was not there, but I left a note on the table for him, and a few minutes later I left town in Graninger's wagon. Chapter 41. A Rheumatic Patient. Daydreams. An Unfortunate Stumble. I Leave Suddenly. Another Patient. Higby in the Cabin. Our Balloon Bursted worth nothing, regrets and explanations, our third partner. Captain Nye was very in ill indeed, with spasmodic rheumatism, but the old gentleman was himself, which is to say he was kind-hearted and agreeable and comfortable, but a singularly violent wildcat when things did not go well. He would be smiling along pleasantly enough when a sudden spasm of his disease would take him, and he would go out of his smile into a perfect fury. He would groan and wail and howl with the anguish and fill up the odd chinks with the most elaborate profanity that strong convictions and a fine fancy could contrive. With fair opportunity, he could swear very well and handle his adjectives with considerable judgment. But when the spasm was on him, it was painful to listen to him. He was so awkward. However, I had seen him nurse a sick man himself and put up patiently with the inconveniences of the situation, and consequently I was willing that he should have full license now that his own turn had come. He could not disturb me with all his raving and ranting, for my mind had work on hand and it labored on diligently night and day, whether my hands were idle or employed. I was altering and amending the plans for my house, and thinking of, over the propriety of having the billiard room in the attic instead of on the insane floor of the dining room. Also, I was trying to decide between green and blue for the up door, tired but jolly, the dingy light of a tallow candle. A candle revealed Higby sitting by the pine table, gazing stupidly at my note, which he held in his fingers and looking pale, old, and haggard. I halted and looked at him. He looked at me stolidly. I said, Higby, what? What is it? We're ruined. We didn't do the work. The blind leads relocated. It was enough. I sat down sick, grieved, broken-hearted indeed. A minute before, I was rich and brimful of vanity. I was a pauper now and very meek. We sat still an hour, busy with thought, busy with vain and useless self-upbraidings, busy with why didn't I do this and why didn't I do that, but neither spoke a word. Then we dropped into mutual explanations and the mystery was cleared away. It came out that Higby had depended on me as I had on him, and as both of us had on the foreman, the folly of it. It was the first time that ever stayed and steadfast Higby had let an important matter to chance or failed to be true to his full share of a responsibility. But he had never seen my note till this moment, and this moment was the first time he had been in the cabin since the day he had seen me last. He also had left a note for me on that same fatal afternoon, had ridden up on horseback and looked through the window and being in a hurry and not seeing me, had tossed the note into the cabin through a broken pane. Here it was on the floor, where it had remained undisturbed for nine days. Don't fail to do the work before the ten days expire. W has passed through and given me notice. I am to join him at Mono Lake, and we shall go on from there tonight. 
He says he will find it this time. Sure. Cal. W meant white man, of course. That thrice accursed cement. That was the way of it. An old miner like Higby could no more withstand the fascination of a mysterious mining excitement like this cement foolishness than he could refrain from eating when he was famished. Higby had been dreaming about the marvelous cement for months, and now against his better judgment he had gone off and taken the chances on my keeping secure a mine worth a million undiscovered cement veins. They had not fo been followed this time. His riding out of town in broad daylight was such a commonplace thing to do that it had not attracted any attention. He said they pr prosecuted their search in the fastness of the mountains during nine days without success. They could not find the cement. Then a ghastly fear came over him that something might have happened to prevent the doing of the necessary work to hold the blind lead, though indeed he thought such a thing hardly possible. And forthwith he started home with all speed. He would have reached Esmeralda in time, but his horse broke down and he had to walk a great part of the distance. And so it happened that as he came into Esmeralda by one road, I entered it by another. His was the superior energy, however, for he went straight to the wide west instead, instead of turning aside as I had done. And he arrived there about five or ten minutes too late. The notice was already up, the relocation of our mind completely beyond, completed beyond recall, and the crowd rapidly dispersing. He learned some facts before he left the ground. The foreman had not been seen about the streets since the night we had located the mine. A telegram had called him to California on a matter of life and death, it was said. At any rate, he had done no work, and the watchful eyes of the community were taking note of the fact. At midnight of this woeful tenth day, the ledge would be relocatable, and by eleven o'clock the hill was black with men preparing to do the re relocating. That was the crowd I had seen when I fancied a new strike had been made, idiot that I was. We three had the same right to relocate the lead that other people had, provided we were quick enough. As midnight was announced, fourteen men, duly armed and ready to back their proceedings, put up their notice and proclaimed their ownership of the blind lead under the new name of the Johnson. But A.D. Allen, our partner, the foreman, put in a sudden appearance about that time with a cocked revolver in his hand and said his name must be added to the list or he would thin out the Johnson Company some. He was a manly, splendid, determined fellow and known to be as good as his word, and therefore a compromise was effected. <coughs> they put in his name for a hundred feet, reserving to themselves the customary two hundred feet each. Such was the history of the night's events as Higby gathered from a friend on the way home. Higby and and I cleared out on a new mining excitement the next morning, glad to get away from the scene of our sufferings, and after a month or two of hardship and disappointment, returned to Esmeralda once more. Then we learned that the Wide West and the Johnson Companies had consolidated, that the stock thus united comprised 5,000 feet or shares, that the foreman, apprehending tiresome litigation and considering such a huge concern unwieldy, had sold his hundred feet for ninety thousand dollars in gold and gone home to the states to enjoy it. If the stock was worth such a gallant figure with five thousand shares in the corporation, it makes me dizzy to think what it would have been worth with only our original six hundred in it. It was the difference between six hundred men owning a house and five thousand owning it. We would have been millionaires if we had only worked with pick and spade one little day on our property and so secured our ownership. It reads like a wild, fancy sketch, but the evidence of many witnesses, and likewise that of the official records of Esmeralda District, is easily obtainable in proof that it is a true history. I can always have it, have it to say that I was absolutely and unquestionably worth a million dollars once for ten days. A year ago, my esteemed and in every way estimable old millionaire partner, Higby, 
wrote me from an obscure little mining camp in California that after nine or ten years of buffetings and hard striving, he was at last in a position where he could come in $2,500 and said he meant to go into the fruit business in a modest way. How such a thought would have insulted him the night we lay in our cabin, planning European trips in brownstone houses on Russian Hill. Chapter 42 What to do next? Obstacles I had met with. Jack of all trades. Mining again. Target shooting. I turn city editor. I succeed, finally. What to do next? It was a momentous question. I had gone out into the world to shift for myself at the age of 13, for my father had endorsed for her friends, and although he left us a sumptuous legacy of pride in his fine Virginian stock and its natural distinction, I presently found that I could not live on that alone without occasional bread to wash it down with. I had gained a livelihood in various vocations, but had not dazzled anybody with my successes. Still, the list was before me, and the amplest liberty in the matter of choosing, provided I wanted to work, which I did not, after being so wealthy. I had once been a grocery clerk for one day, but had consumed so much sugar in that time that I was relieved from further duty by the proprietor. He said he wanted me outside so that he could have my custom. I had studied law an entire week and then given it up because it was so prosy and tiresome. I had engaged briefly in the study of blacksmithing, but wasted so much time trying to fix the bellows so that it would blow itself that the master turned me adrift in disgrace and told me I would come to no good. I had been a bookseller's clerk for a while, but the customers bothered me so much I could not read with any comfort. And so the proprietor gave me a furlough and forgot to put a limit on to it. I had clerked in a drugstore part of a summer, but my prescriptions were unlucky, and we appeared to sell more stomach pumps than soda water, so I had to go. I had made of myself a tolerable printer under the impression that I would be another Franklin some day, but somehow had missed the connection thus far. There was no berth open in the Esmeralda Union, and besides, I had always been such a slow compositor that I looked with envy upon the achievements of apprentices of two years' standing. And when I took a take, foremen were in the habit of suggesting that it would be wanting some time during the year. I was a good, average St. Louis and New Orleans pilot, and by no means ashamed of my abilities in that line. Wages were $250 a month and no board to pay, and I did long to stand behind a wheel again and never roam any more. But I had been making such an ass of myself lately in grandiloquent letters home about my blind lead and my European excursion that I did what many and many a poor disappointed miner had done before, said, It is all over with me now and I will never go back home to be pitied and snubbed.